You know, it almost seems impossible for the Legend of Zelda series to put out a bad game. Arguably, the series only releases quality games that everybody loves and enjoys. But not you, though. You don't count. Lamboil. Rope? Bombs? You want it? It's yours, my friend, as long as you have enough rubies. And even if there might be a weaker game in the series, it's usually up to standard and offers a lot of content and room for fun to be had. An example for me personally would be the Triforce Heroes game from the 3DS. A pretty fun game admittedly, I played this game a lot when it came out when I was 15, but even I have to say it's a pretty weak entry into the series itself. In recent years, Zelda has been running towards the 3D era, which makes sense considering the vast critical acclaim for these games like Ocarina of Time and Breath of the Wild have had. The series last adventure in the 2D top-down perspective was in 2019 with Link's Awakening, and that game isn't even new. It's a remake from the Game Boy Color game of the same name. I wouldn't say that the series is running away from its roots though, because let's be honest, it's just a natural evolution for games to modernize, but the classic way to play the games are always going to be remembered fondly. The top-down perspective is this series bread and butter. It's what it does best, so it's no surprise, but the majority of the games in the series are in this format. A lot of discussion would be around which game in this format would be considered the best out of all of them. And because a lot of games play in the top-down format, I personally believe you can make a case for any game in this series to be the best, because that's just how good in quality they are. But for myself, I feel that there's one game that stands on top of the rest, a game that basked in its creativity and design and gameplay that truly deserved the title of being the greatest top-down Zelda game, and that game being, of course, the top topic of today's video, The Legend of Zelda, The Minish Cap. The Minish Cap is a peculiar release within the series itself, the reason being that it's one of the five games created by Capcom instead of Nintendo, the other four games being Oracle of Seasons and Ages, Four Swords, and Four Sword Adventures respectively. As you may notice, some of these games are heavily linked to one another. The Oracle games were actually originally conceived as a remake to the original Legend of Zelda game, but development quickly turned the game into its own duology of games, and the Four Sword games being something new to the series entirely, opting into a co-op adventure, thus developing its own identity into the series itself. The Minish Cap almost feels like an outlier in this set, but ultimately contains its own identity as a game that sets up as the prequel to the Four Sword game and is hands down one of the most creative parts of the series thanks to the introduction of the Minish world, aka a basically a mystical world of becoming small. In a lot of ways, Minish Minish Cap feels like Capcom's magnum opus, since this was the last game that they developed for the series releasing in the end of 2004. The Minish Cap was defined in the end as one last hurrah for Capcom, and in turn gives it the feeling of being a love letter to the very series that it's a part of. The Minish Cap has always struck me as one of the more unique entries into the series as well, despite admittedly not yet playing every single Zelda game, but from the games I actually have played, and from the ones that I know of, this game in particular oozes so much charm and love, and that it's simply hard to ignore it. Growing up I had played this game from my cousin's Game Boy Advance, and you know as a child we all experience games differently, and a lot of us never even get the chance to, to beat a lot of games, since let's be honest, we were just too dumb to figure out most of this stuff out in the games, but I always yearn for the chance to play it again, and of course there's always the option of sailing the seas in search of a way to play it elsewhere, if you catch my drift. Yet personally, it always felt weird to play games that way. Sitting around waiting for a port is almost impossible, as it seems as if Nintendo isn't too interested with these older games, especially ones on the Game Boy Advance. The most one could hope for is a remake, as Nintendo seems willing to do them, given even the recent Link's Awakening remake on the Switch of course, but the Nintendo Switch does bring one thing to the table, the Nintendo Switch online library of old games. And after waiting patiently, Nintendo granted us access to the Game Boy and Game Boy Advance catalog of selected games, and long and behold, the Minish Cap was selected as one of the starting games to be put onto that catalog. So that brings us here, I have gone back and played through, and most importantly finish the Minish Cap after so many years, and it was a wonderful experience. I love this game so much, and I have good reason to believe that this game is the best out of the mass collection of top-down Zelda games, so come along and join me today as I give my take on this beautiful game, and maybe along the way, you too will understand my point of view. Although in 
retrospective area of the video might be on the shorter side, I still find it necessary to talk about the quality of the visuals within the Minish Cap. When you look back at other games beginning with the first game to release on the NES, we see an aesthetic that encapsulates the sense of adventure that the game's latest groundwork on top of, and at the time, huge world to explore its secrets in an almost seamless way moving from screen to screen. All of this, mind you, being played back all the way back in 1986, in the series Infancy. Moving on to the Dark Horse entry of the franchise in its sequel game, Zelda II The Adventure of Link, we see a change of direction in not only gameplay but also art style, opting for a side-scrolling adventure with some much more realized visuals of the characters and an overworld that seems to me at least to draw a lot of inspiration from the Dragon Quest games. Soon with the release of the SNES, it would eventually bring updated visuals for all games entering this generation, but of course, a new Zelda game. A Link to the Past is a huge overhaul in its art direction compared to the previous releases, and that of course is to be expected, but even still, the game looks great even to this very day in 2023. A Link to the Past sprite work and overall visual fidelity lays a lot of what we see in these top-down Zelda games to incorporate into their own design, with a much more visual bombable walls and even a widely more interactive environment among the map. Link's Awakening went and showed a lot of people what the Game Boy could do for a handheld console at the time, giving you access to an adventure where you could play at any time and graphics that make the NES game wish it was made this way. The Oracle game lead into the same look and feel as the previous handheld experience, but with development of course originally forming as a remake of the first game, it almost makes sense for the two comparisons to come full circle. Since Four Sword Adventures was made for the GameCube, it needed to be said that of course the game looked great, but as I personally noticed that its quality of sprite work is fairly reminiscent of A Link to the Past, for a large part being because that it's on a home console. Quality tends to be a bit higher here. You may have noticed that I left out the original Four Sword game, and well that's because as you may notice, the art style is simply the same as the one used for the Minish Cap, and that's not to say that they're lazy and reusing assets, no, far from it. It gives this short adventure as its own self-worth as a pseudo demo for the eventual conceptualization of the Minish Cap itself. The Minish Cap is the last 2D pixel art game within the series, and with hardware getting better and better every year, eventually, it's a no-brainer to think that the future releases of the franchise's top-down Zelda games would incorporate the use of 3D models for their graphics. And I think ultimately because of that, the visual style of the Minish Caps is supposed to encapsulate the 2D art style of the series in its final perfected form. Of course, while the drawn art style takes a lot of liberties from the Wind Waker, its actual in-game sprites lead its inspiration for the scale used for Link himself from the Link to the Past character designs, but not only that, with a smaller world thanks to the fact that it's a handheld title, it shows Capcom's previous outing creating the Oracle games as practice into the insight used for creating the overworld for the Minish Cap, and that in turn it means it takes design cues from a recreation that they intended those games to originally be. So much so, in fact, that they have an entire mini dungeon in the Minish Cap that pays homage to the dungeon from the first Zelda game, that being the Royal Crypt. But that's not all. This game actually has a lot of moments to flex its mastery of animation, even if it's not as crazy as games such as Warrior Land 4 that's also on the same system. We see many times in the game that the quality in which Link himself and characters or even enemies move around the world show. From swinging the sword, drawing the bow, and the way enemies attack or how some characters run around the town, the game is constantly moving and you the player are constantly moving along with it as you play as Link. Even the smaller things are impressive, like getting hit, falling in water, falling down a hole, when you're burning up, and my personal favorite, the funny moment where Link is screaming literal death as he rides a minecart in the Cave of Flames. <laughs> And that's just only in the bigger world. The way you see the world as a Minish brings out a lot when you're in these smaller environments. Seeing how the Minish live throughout the world using everyday items as an important tool to live, like a table or a bed sheet, is simply charming in its creativity. A lot of locations in the game scream personality at this smaller size too. From inside the house, a normal rock becoming a huge mine shaft, or even a town made from mushrooms inside of a forest. It's able to take seemingly normal concepts and mold them into a living world for the Minish and turn them into living and breathing important aspects of the land of Hyrule. The game's bright color palette also makes this game stand out extremely well, giving it extra character and personality as it leaves in being the most visually pleasing game to remember fondly of. <laughs> Legend of Zelda 
Nintendo game, for the most part, have retained its basic core gameplay throughout its lifetime. The most consistent features of its gameplay being its hacking slash combat, the focus on exploration within its overworld, and its puzzle solving nature littered all throughout the land of Hyrule, but mainly inside of the various dungeons that you come across throughout the games that you play. It's pretty wild that the franchise has stuck to the gameplay loop that it offers to the player, since a lot of series like this tend to experiment and do something different in its later years. That's not to say that Zelda has not experimented with the gameplay formula either, Link's crossbow training is a prime example, but in terms of mainline games, the only game that stands out is the Breath of the Wild that truly wants to innovate or experiment with its gameplay, but also wordly manages it to stay largely the same as the other types of gameplay at the same time. But as the old saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and thankfully, the Minish Cap keeps this saying close to its heart. Zelda has always had a great and simple gameplay loop within its games, and while those other games may do as well as the Minish Cap does, I still feel as if the Minish Cap feels the most natural and most fun throughout the series. If you're wondering what this gameplay loop is that I even speak of, well the best way to root it is as following. Exploration fuels the combat that you'll be engaging in, it hits that right switch for you to explore more and more as you want to beat up some more enemies, and in doing so, it also leads you to more treasures and secrets among the overworld which all eventually lead to the point that you will be in a dungeon solving more puzzles, and that also leads to an eventual final boss of said dungeon. Do you see what I mean when I said it's a whole loop? You're constantly doing these things within the Minish Cap that makes it feel so natural with the way that you go about it, and I think an integral aspect of the naturalness is finding the key items within the game. As you find certain items, like let's say for example the flippers, which allow you to swim, you remember the world has a ton of water spots to swim in, and it makes you want to go back and see what those new areas have to offer. It creates a sense of flow to the game. It's as if you're never stopping the flow of the game because you know that new areas of the game are constantly being unlocked, and from going from area to area in the game is what truly makes a Zelda game feel like a Zelda game. There's nothing better than combat that's simple yet also extremely fun. And honestly, any Zelda game has pretty great combat all things considered, but what makes Diminished Cap contain combat that's definitively better than the others? Well, in all honesty, I can't really say why, since fun is objectively a subjective thing to actually label, but I do have my own personal reason as to why I feel the combat for this game is to be the most fun you can have within any game in the series. The button layout you're offered is fairly simple. Two buttons for any item that you have in your arsenal, and then a shoulder R button that allows you to roll. Although this two button layout is admittedly a project of its time, seeing as in the Link's Awakening remake you're able to use a lot more items than you previously would have, I still think the layout is easy enough to understand, and that most of the time, you're gonna have a sword equipped on a button for at least 98% of the game, and that second button is always designated to whatever item you need to switch to at that time. And with how areas and dungeons within the game are laid out, you're honestly never gonna be needing to constantly switch between these items either. While you have the sword equipped, your basic combat options are available to you from the start. But that's not all, as you play through the game, you will find certain characters within these dojos that will teach you new techniques to be able to use with the sword, equaling to a total of 8 new techniques that you can obtain throughout the game. These new moves are all very helpful, and a few of them are linked with the use of specific items, like the Pegasus Boots or the Rockscape. The slow progression of your sword moves is great for the game, because you constantly feel yourself getting stronger, along with yourself also feeling stronger once you obtain new items as well. It's almost like a big snowball effect taking place, and I absolutely love it when games do that. Speaking of items, the vast amount of items are great, and in fact, they they all interact with not only the world and its puzzle solving, but also how you fight enemies throughout the game as well. Some are fairly basic, like the gust jar blowing enemies away, and also blowing away dust or sand around the world. But let me tell you right now, the game makes small things like this feel huge. The gust jar can not only blow stuff away, but it can also suck stuff up to allow you to get jars or boulders stuck into the jar and for you to be able to shoot them back at other enemies. But it's also a great item for how you navigate the world. As a Minish, 
hopping onto a lily pad and using the jar basically turns it into a makeshift boat that can allow you to ride along the water. When you're in the overworld, you're able to use it on mushrooms and it will fling you across a big cliff. This is a great way to make an item feel important to the gameplay and make you wonder what else that its uses could be for. My personal favorite item within the game does this too, the cane of Pachi. This item allows you to be able to flip things over and that means almost anything within the game, including the player themselves. If you use the cane towards a hole in the ground, it makes a little thing that spins around, and if you were to jump into it, it would in turn make you do a big jump out of the hole to get onto higher places you normally wouldn't be able to reach within the game. A smaller yet very important part of the combat is the ability to duplicate yourself creating copies of Link to help out with puzzles. And although for the most part in the game that its major purpose is linked to these puzzles, there are some selections in the game that you actually have to use it for combat, needing you to hit multiple objects at the same time that won't allow you to progress it if you were to do it one by one. All of these specific types of gameplay options are important for this game and allow you to mix up how you play on the fly. You're able to have a lot more freedom in the way that you take on multiple enemies or just how you take on multiple puzzles at the same time as well. And personally, I believe that that's what makes the combat within the game really, really fun. The next part of the gameplay I want to talk about is the in-game exploration itself. Exploration is an integral part of Zelda, and it's important for the game to nail it right. The Minish Cap does exploration within the game phenomenally, and it also mixes it up widely synced to the inclusion of the Kinstone fusions. This new mechanic in the game is widely important throughout the game, as some areas will just not unlock if you don't find Kinstones that match up with the corresponding stone that it needs to connect with. These specific stones are color cord to show their importance and to what they do overall. The golden ones relate to the ones that match with the story related areas that you must go to. The red ones mean that new secrets are available around the map and possibly interact with more characters. A great example is that it's how you're able to unlock the remote bomb upgrade. The green stones solely just drop chests around the map or possible golden enemies and this color is widely regarded as the common fusions for the game. And finally the blue stones has a mix of what the green and what red ones do, but the results do vary on who you are fusing with. These kinstones and kinstone fusions are scattered all throughout the map and are available to be made by interacting with every single character in the overworld as well. It's always usually a great idea to constantly fuse stones with characters to constantly unlock new stuff as you're playing the game. Plus, this mechanic gives it the added benefit of making every single NPC have their own importance in the game completely dependent on what the player feels. Obviously, this makes exploration have its own set of gameplay in some ways, but it's also apparent that the map needs to be able to have the importance itself too. And thankfully, the map is neatly and tightly designed to support this added functionality of the kinstones. Each area connects nicely and is overall really easy to navigate in of itself. And because of how you attain items within the game, it also gives these areas extra places to explore, leading you to get to more and more corners throughout the overworld. And when you're in these new areas in the overworld, Road, you also might be able to find more kinstone fusions to do or items from the kinstone fusions that you previously obtained. This is another gameplay loop that the game offers to let you explore at your own pace and even if you do decide to ignore most of the areas it still might have you try to look around for item upgrades that you might want to find or even story related items that you'll probably be needing anyway later on in the story. But within this world we of course have the minish areas of the game as well and have how you navigate the world in the smaller size. When you start out near the beginning, you'll notice that you can, for the most part, freely roam around certain areas as a minish, depending, of course, if you can get to the outside. And while you get through this game and get more items as you go along, the areas do expand in the smaller size as well, mainly being due to the point that when you get the flippers, which allow you to swim, usually the smallest amount of water would be like an ocean or a lake when you're at the smaller size. So these flippers, allow you to swim in these previously inaccessible areas. There's also even more kinstone fusions to access here once you open up the area in this small size, again leading more to a bigger gameplay loop within the exploration. This game shows so much care
care in how you play the game itself. It thinks of almost everything and how you interact with the world and its characters, and it's oh so great to see so much vision the developers wanted for the player to experience here. They wanted them to simply have fun and find new things within Hyrule, and they showed it all off perfectly. <laughs> Personally, I'm a firm believer that gameplay is king, and overall, a game doesn't need a story for it to be fun. But I also appreciate the attempt at a story that, at the very least, tries to capture the player to be interested in the world and characters. The Minish Cap finds itself in an admittedly grey area when it comes to its story though. It's fairly interesting in concept, but it never focuses on it nearly as long enough for the player to really care much for it. The parts that the player will remember though is the backstory behind the main villain Vati, and the Minish that sits on top of your head throughout the game, Ezlo. The turmoil that exists between these two characters are extremely interesting, Ezlo being Vati's master, and Vati growing an ego and his skills of sorcery, leading for him to turn Ezlo into a hat, and eventually that leads all up to the very beginning of the game, to the Pikori Festival. I think in general the game does extremely well in its character interactions and relationships, and even if you aren't into the story as much, the interactions given to you are all pretty charming to see. But because of that, I'd like to really keep this section of the video to be a really short recap of the story. It's mainly going to serve as a way to really talk about the dungeons in short detail, as a way for me to kind of just like segue really easily into it. So let's get started shall we? Starting off at the beginning, it's the day of the Pikori Festival and Zelda has come over to Link's house to pick him up. I do in fact like the fact that Link and Zelda are childhood friends here. It's much more simpler than the other iterations of these characters. And at this festival, there's a swordsman tournament, prize being the legendary Pikori Blade that's sealed inside a box. The winner is coincidentally Vati, who opens the box and unleashes evil upon Hyrule, and also turns Zelda into stone. And boom, that's our entire setup to the story. Link is now tasked with saving Zelda and Hyrule. He then takes the broken remains of the Makori blade left by Vati and heads into the Minish Forest to find the Earth Element to restore the blade. When he's here, he eventually finds Ezlo struggling along the forest ground, and that's how we basically meet the Navi of the game. Ezlo allows us to shrink down into a Minish and now that we can do that, we can enter the Minish village and also gain the ability to speak to the Minish. And then soon we are granted access to the dungeon containing the earth element. Now entering the Deepwood Shrine, we have a pretty interesting beginner dungeon. The main element here is that we have a big barrel in the middle that you can enter and spin around to go out the five possible exits. You obtain the Gust Jar here, which will be the important item that you'll be using in this dungeon the most. All of this will eventually lead to the final boss, and man, I have to say, this is why I love the Minish mechanic in the game. It leads to really creative locations and creative bosses. And here, you'll be facing a completely normal green choo-choo. Of course, at normal size, this enemy is basically fodder. But here, at this Minish size, it's a very intimidating foe. And by using the Gust Jar to suck up the jelly, it will allow you to topple it over and help you defeat it. And then after that, you'll be granted the first element in the game, the Earth Element. Next up, Link's gotta head to Mount Cernal to find the Minish Swordsmiths to upgrade the broken Pikori Blade. You'll have to climb your way up here though, but once you do, you are heading into the next dungeon into the game to collect the next element. The Cave of Flames is a huge upgrade in the dungeon department compared to the last one you're in, being as this is a dungeon that you'll be getting the infamous Kane Apache. You'll see a lot of minecarts that are upside down and platforms that are floating across the lava. You'll have to use this cane to help navigate throughout the dungeon, and the cane will also help you fight the boss of the dungeon, the Glee Rock. You'll notice that he has one of those floating platforms that was on the lava on his back, which makes it apparent to use the cane on him. And once you do, you'll be able to walk onto his neck and actually hit his back. Overall, it's a pretty fun boss, even if it is fairly easy. Once done, you'll get the flame element and you'll go back to the swordsmith to get your Pikori blade back and it's now fixed. Now that you have both the earth and flame element, you need to head on down to the Hyrule Cast to get to the elemental sanctuary to get a quick upgrade on your new blade to allow you to do the duplication mechanic. After that, you'll be on the hunt for the wind element, but unfortunately the area that you need to go to is inaccessible, so you'll be on a quick quest to get the Pegasus boots from the Shoemaker, which you need to wake up with the mushroom from the Witch Syrup. Once you do obtain it, you can head on out to the Castor Wild to look around for Golden Kinstone to allow you access to the Wind Ruins, and then this will lead you to the next dungeon, the Wind Fortress. Now personally, I really enjoy this dungeon, not because of the puzzles within it, but the boss is just so well done. Before we get to that, just know that you'll get the moments here, and they'll be very 
very important for said boss. What makes bosses so great in this game is that at this point in the game, the items that you get, you'll be using a lot of them to help you defeat the bosses. Combining all these mechanics together so seamlessly is so much fun. And in this dungeon, you'll be up against the Mazal. First, you shoot the eye on his hand, which will have it drop down. And then you'll have to become small at the conveniently placed Minish portal in the boss room. And then you have to use the moment to, as you traverse the inside of the head of the boss to hit the right weak spot within. This boss is just perfectly designed and honestly it would be my favorite boss in the game for how simple yet intuitive it is. After that boss, unfortunately, there is no win element here, it's somewhere else, but at least you have some new items like the wind ocarina to help you fast travel. Since the wind element is MIA, let's go look for the water element. But to get that, we need a swim, so it's time for another side quest to find the flippers. This one being linked behind a wild goose chase for late library book to get to the minish that live within the library. Doing so will eventually lead you to get the flippers so we can head back to Lake Hilliard and drop down into the Temple of Droplets, which is a cleverly disguised minish portal. This dungeon is another minish sized dungeon with the added element of being a water based dungeon, and they do a really good job making it fun. Using the lily pad to sail around the place is great, and although the ice puzzles are pretty annoying, not too hard. Since this is a minish dungeon, the boss here is actually an octo rock that's been thawed out of ice. Earlier in the dungeon, you got the lantern, and it's gonna be the way you're gonna damage it for this fight, alongside deflecting back the huge rocks it spits at you. Again, I love that the fact that these weak enemies used in the overworld are being used as big bad bosses as a minish. Next up, the ghost of King Gustav directs Link to the royal crypt to have him complete a mini dungeon to gain an important golden kinstone that'll help Link get up to the area where the wind element will be. Before you do, make sure you do fuse the element with that you just collected with your sword back at the sanctuary. Once you fit in that golden kinstone, the path to the wind element will be pretty long. You'll have to go up the Vale Falls and then traverse to the area into the cloud to help out the wind tribe people to grant you access to the palace of winds. Once you're inside the dungeon, we're officially in the best dungeon in the game. This dungeon is extremely long and requires the rock's cape to help you jump around the floating platforms. A bunch of ways to fall off and overall, a really good time to navigate. The boss here, the Gjord Pair, a duo of flying manta ray-like things, I guess, but nonetheless, you'll be jumping from back to back to deal damage to these two over time, using the clones of Link to help you deal sufficient damage to the boss to be able to take it down. Afterward, you will have all four elements in the game, which means you have to go fuse it back into the blade and finally save Zelda. It's finale time, and Vati has revealed that he's been using you to collect all the elements. You coulda fooled me. But he turns the entire Hyrule Castle into his own dark castle, and now it's up to you to not only save Zelda, but the others within the castle since they're now turned to stone as well. The dungeon here is simple. It's mainly a gauntlet against a bunch of dark nuts, and when you defeat them, they give you keys that will eventually be able to lead you to a big key to enter the main boss area. And the fight against Fati is no joke. This boss has three total phases, and the difficulty spike here is insane. You'll be using all your items in this fight, and this is what I consider the best fight in the game. It takes a lot of elements from the Mazal fight earlier and makes it even better here. Needing you to not only switch between items, you also need to shrink into a Minish and duplicate Link to deal with final last hits in an extremely hard section of this fight in the end. Afterwards, Vati will be sealed within your sword, which will be relevant in the four sword games, and Ezlo and the Elemental Sanctuary will go back to wherever the hell they come from. Congrats, everyone is saved and that is probably the quickest way I can explain the entire game's plot as best as I can. I think everything meshes really well thanks to the Minish sections of the game. The creative process they went through here felt like a great switch up from the player would normally be used to. And the characters all are really great, Ezlo and Vati being of course the highlights within the game. Vati's such a good villain to the fact that he even returns again in the series so that says a lot. I think overall the story is pretty serviceable and it works great to have you go to the areas and dungeons within the game. It's all simply charming and I think a lot more people should appreciate a simple narrative that extremely fun to play. <music>
the final section of this long retrospective, I feel the personal need to talk about some of the side content available for the game, and this also accounts for something that's related to a real life product that I have loved in my childhood. Although looking back, the game doesn't have a ton of side quests. The game has a few unlockables throughout the various kinstone fusions in the game, a great example being the fusions with the Tingle Brothers that will allow you to get the magic boomerang. But there is specifically one thing that I have yet to talk about this whole video, and that's the large amount of figurines you're able to collect thanks to the mysterious shells currency that you find all throughout the land of Hyrule. This big gotcha game adventure is extremely controversial due to the fact that there are a total of 136 of these things that you have to collect, and the more that you do collect, it gets harder and harder to obtain new ones without forking over like a hundred shells per pull. This huge piece of side content wouldn't have too much disdain towards the community if I didn't have an entire piece of heart locked behind the completion of the figurines. And honestly, I agree with the opinion of this being the worst aspect of this game entirely, making it a chore just to even attempt to get 100% on this game. But despite it all, I can kind of see why they decided to add this into the game. Remember, this is a handheld game and I'm sure a lot of us can remember a game that we played as a kid that we sunk so many hours on into. And this added content in the game is simply in my eyes a way to sink more hours into it, using all your shells to put in more figurines, buy more shells, and then going around the world to collect more rupees for your wallet. It's all just a way for players to continue to play a game that they love more and more, and I really can't fault the game for doing this, all things considered. Next up, really quick, we have the hardest minigame I've ever played, the Kuko minigame. Why is this so hard? It's not like the beginning stages on this minigame is hard, it's, it's only in the middle parts where it gets unbelievably hard. It asks you to get like 7 cuckoos in like 40 seconds, and it feels like the timing is just so tight to collect them all on time. The final levels of the game isn't even hard compared to the middle ones either. The final ones are super forgiving and fairly easy. At the very least, this minigame is really good for getting really easy money really fast if you have a consistent route down to make it reliable. And a neat little fact that I came across while writing the script for this very video, there was a side quest in the game that's seemingly unfinished and a YouTuber named Zeltic has made a video explaining this entire short quest, so if you want to check that out, I'm going to leave that up into the top right corner in the iCard and in the description. I highly recommend it, it's really good. And finally, I want to mention the Minish Cap manga. This released back in 2006 in Japan and 2009 in America. This was a short 7 chapter manga that was honestly really great. I owned it as a kid after seeing it in the kids section at Barnes & Noble, and I remember really enjoying it since I was really familiar with the material. There's not really a point for this being here, I just thought it was a really cool thing to mention. As we enter the final few minutes of this long, long retrospective, I have a few things I want to mention here. So this entire section of the video will be completely unscripted and just off the top of my head, so I hope that's fine. Mainly because I, I script a lot for this video and I honestly don't want to script anymore. So I'm hoping this whole freeform type of this part is going to be pretty fine. But I just want to come out and say that the Minish Cap means a lot to me. Or, well, mainly as a game that I played as a kid but never finished. I mean, I played the game when I was younger only for the fact that it was my, my cousin's game. Game Boy. I never had the time to really sink into the many hours since it was hers and she played it the most. But I always wanted to come back to this game and although I never finished it, I was I still really liked the characters in the world. I mean, it's kind of like my gateway into the Legend of Zelda series. That's why mentioning the manga earlier, I really loved that manga a lot because it was kind of like my in for actually experiencing the world and story and kind of the reason why I see this particular game in like rose tinted glasses. I understand this game might be beloved might not be beloved by everybody and that's fine I, everybody has their own preferences when it comes to video games and i'm not going to sit here and act like the minish cap is the most perfect game ever made because it's not it definitely has its flaws especially since i recently replayed it and finished it thanks to the nintendo switch online but even then playing it in 2023 was a lie it was a good ex it was a great experience and frankly i would play the game again i would would still have to get 100% because, you know, figurines are kind of annoying to collect, but, you know, there's nothing like a little podcast in the background could fix, or apparently, I guess, the rewind function on it works. 
I don't know. I don't really use that function as much as I can. The Minish Cap is a great game. I love it. I wanted to make this whole video to talk about it. And this video kind of is a precursor to something else I want to make in the future. And this is a whole practice. There's a practice retrospective. So I hope it was fine in that regard. If you guys also love the Minish Cap, as much as I do, you should leave a like and leave a comment talking about the game, reminiscing. Let's all reminisce together about this game because I really like it and I'm sure a lot of other people like it as well. If you don't like it, you should still comment. L let me know why you feel like you don't like this game because for me, I don't really get to talk with many people that dislike games that I like a ton of the time. Most people that I know, we all like the same games. So it's nice to hear another perspective on what they're trying to say for a game like this. It'd just be really interesting to talk about or just hear some thoughts and opinions but other than that thank you guys for watching i hope you guys enjoyed it was a long video leave a like and subscribe it really helps out i will be back with more hopefully in the future eventually and i'll see you guys all next time Come